ownership having had a really good run. And I've got two great people to talk about this subject with. This is, these are the, our go-to guys when we want to know about the auto industry. Bloomberg News U.S. Autos editor Craig Trudell, who's in from Detroit. And we've also got Kevin Tynan. He's our Bloomberg Intelligence Global Director of Automotive Research. Um, you do all this research. You do all the financial <laughs> digging into these companies. We're going to talk about the mobility revolution because there's so much going on. And we want to talk about what the auto industry is doing to kind of embrace it uh, with all these changings. We're going to be answering your questions. You're part of this event. So leave them uh, in the comments on Facebook, also on YouTube. And you can tweet us at uh, BW, of course, for Business Week, and send them over as we're talking. Keep them coming. We've got some questions that have already been sent in, but we want to make you part of this conversation. So first of all, Bloomberg Business Week did a great cover story, and they asked the question, are we at peak car? And they said auto sales in the U.S. after to four record or near record years, they're declining this year. And analysts say they may never again reach those heights. At the same time, we've got, what, 1.3 billion vehicles out on the road. So I'm curious, Kevin, Craig, Craig, let's kick it off with you. What's going on? So it, it was funny when we sort of started with this project, uh, it was around uh, the, the time of the Detroit Auto Show, and we sort of uh, did a bit of taste testing with some of the executives who were in town for the show. This year? This year. And we, we it was it was sort of, uh, it was very reminiscent of some of the pushback that uh, some of the reporters on this story uh, got uh, for, for a story that they did five years earlier, where they talked about this concept of peak car that was just at that time starting to be sort of a, a conversation. Uh, there was a lot of resistance still to this idea that, you know, as long as we have population growth, uh, essentially we're going to have uh, growth of, of cars. But I think a lot of the, the questions about whether or not we are at a, a point of peak car are really as much about sort of demographics and this these trends of urbanization as much as anything, because you have uh, just just a, a rise of, of all of these alternatives to owning a car uh, that could contribute to a serious decline in, in demand for them. Right. It's the whole sharing economy. We've got scooters. Kevin, we've got lots of other things going on. Yeah, and I think that that diversity and variety is actually the point, right? So, um, and we see it in electrified drivetrains, right, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. whether it's ride sharing, whether it's mass transit, whether it's private ownership, I think to satisfy the vehicle miles traveled of those demographics, we need options. And I think rather than this being like a zero sum game between me jumping on a scooter to get home or owning a vehicle, it's both, right? There's gonna be times where I need other forms of transportation to get to where I'm going, um, but I don't see where nobody ever owns a, a, a car a, privately owns a, a vehicle anymore um, because you're going to need that that variability, that variety, those options. Well, and like you said, we've had these you know discussions about peak car before, but I do wonder if something has shifted. You know, we've seen it in retail, the sharing economy, where I look at some of the teenagers out there or my nieces who are in their twenties, and they don't seem to care if they've got a car or not. They need it to get around, but it's not so crucial, it seems. Have we seen something change? I, I do think that there's really a, a case to be made for that. Uh, there, are a, there are a few different things contributing to that. I think, you know, there, there was a, a time when the car was seen as sort of the ultimate symbol of, of freedom, and I think that was definitely a seed that was planted, uh, you know, by companies in Detroit and Stuttgart and, and, uh, and, and well, Tokyo. It was a rite of passage in many ways. Right, right. and, and I, I think there's a little bit of, of that, that flower sort of wilting a little bit where I, I think you do see this sort of negative uh, drawbacks of, of owning a car uh, and sort of the lead anecdote of, of this story that Keith Naughton and, and David Welch did out of Detroit for us is, is a guy in Boston who uh, was willing actually to pay roughly $20,000 a year right. to basically use uh, Uber and Lyft to, to get around. He's a tech than, executive, so yes. he can afford that $20,000. And, and he's definitely an extreme case. I don't think that this is you know sort of a model for the future here, but he he is very much a person who sort of you know demonstrates or or is an example of this idea of like you know I, I don't actually want to have to dig my car out from the snow every you right. know, every morning in the winter uh, and I you know my my time is valuable and I I would rather save the the time of and the hassle of of maintaining and and having a car 
and pay more actually to be driven instead of own my own vehicle. I'm thinking about, you know, those folks that are listening to this. Like if you live in my neighborhood where if you move a car, you lose your parking spot. <laughs> like there are times if you're going out at night, you're like, I'm going to take an Uber or Lyft. So you do think about um, some different things. Why are we having this conversation now? Is it because the Lyft IPO is coming and we're waiting for the Uber IPO? Why yeah. is it, Kevin? Well, I think there's, and it's interesting, I was having this discussion with another uh, Bloomberg intelligence analyst yesterday in a different sector, actually in airlines, about, you know, I can't remember a time where we had, and I'll call them questionable business models, getting so much valuation. And, and I'm thinking about- Like 20 billion, is it right, for Lyft and counting? North, yeah, potentially north of, yeah. North of yeah, yeah, and I don't mean to say questionable in a bad way. I'm just saying yeah. that, you know, as an analyst, as you walk down the income statement and you get to that bottom line and you say, okay, why would this be valued the way it is? And I'm thinking, um, you know, Tesla is one of them. When you look at their valuation, per unit globally compared to the Toyota, Volkswagen, General Motors of the world, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't really reconcile. Um, Uber and Lyft would be the other examples. The other one, too, is in retail, which is a name called Carvana, mm -hmm. which is doing this sort of online-only pre-owned vehicle that's getting this valuation that, that just, it's, it's astounding to what they're getting for how big they are. Or and are they profitable? No, and, and the value that they add in the process. But the idea of like, oh, well, you don't have to talk to a salesperson ever. You can do this process all online. And right. that goes back to, you know, the, the previous question about, you know, when we were growing up, that car, your bicycle was about that freedom and it was about connecting with people. Mm -hmm. My sons, who are, you know, college age, grew up connected to people virtually, right? Like yeah. they play esports and they're on a team with people in Europe. Right. You know, so they're connected in a different way than we needed to be c connected when we were growing up. I just think it's kind of crazy. And if I think about growing up and it was like you never get in a car with strangers and now we do it all the time and oh, we yeah. don't think twice about it. Right. So I want to get to some of the questions that we've got that were sent in. Um, Vincent sent in one and he wants to know the specifics about kind of our time frame. So he says, what is your best estimate of the time horizon for the change to cars as a service for the majority of drivers, right? So it seems like we're getting to mobility as a service versus as so much about kind of the car manufacturing. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think it's to Craig's point about um, the demographic shift, right? If, if we have a lot of people living in urban areas, then maybe that shift happens faster. Um, I think from a business case perspective, to me, I think the full level five self-driving vehicle is really the key to everything. I'm not saying I think it's possible. I'm not sure the science makes sense or the yeah. business case makes sense, but I think that shift is different if you can take the driver out of the car completely and make that business case viable. And now this idea of peak car or no private vehicle ownership because they're all zipping around by themselves. Right. Whether that's actually possible, I, 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 I'm skeptical of that, but uh, to me, that's sort of the tipping point. If we ever achieve level five or when we achieve level five, I think that the idea of the world is different. Is that what we call it, level five? I yeah, that. That, that would but be I no mean, pedals, no steering but you, wheel. You, you won't put a time frame on it. I, I, I'm not even sure it's possible. Yeah. Well, and so I, I think the, the, this, the answer uh, in some cases, it, it's already happening where you're actually seeing with, with some cities in, in particular, I think th they're going to increasingly sort of drive the bus here, uh, sort of uh, pun intended, yeah. where they, they are uh, really cracking down on, on uh, the, the problems with pollution, the po problems with congestion, and, and really getting serious about, uh, about sort of you know, car bans or uh, preventing people from being able to drive into to city centers. Congestion uh, taxes, right? Or exactly, and, and you see this in Paris where people uh, are prevented from being able to drive into into the city on certain days of the week uh, to uh, to cut down on congestion and, and pollution, where you'll, you'll see more and more of that happening. Uh, and you're seeing it as well in, in places like San Francisco where you know, just in, in the last couple months, uh, you know, I, I went for a visit and it was amazing to me how much Uber was pushing their pool option, mm -hmm. which meant, you know, mm -hmm. to your point I about that getting, being more. Yeah. getting into the car yeah. with strangers, uh, which, you know, maybe have, would have been uh, unthinkable, uh, you know, years ago. 
but this was really this is really something that's being pushed on Uber as much as Uber is is you know the the one uh, pushing for it. Right. And it's because uh, they're sort of getting pushback about how much are you really solving for the problem of of congestion and and uh, you know the environment right. when you're actually contributing to more cars going into the city centers at, at peak time. And we're going to get into that with China because we're seeing pushback there because they're yep. so concerned about pollution. Ian had a question and I want to bring this up. He says he too wanted to know the time scale you know, for alternative powered vehicles to begin to dominate the commercial and individual market. But he says, you know, what is the time frame given a lack of charging facilities for electric and hydrogen powered vehicles, the dominance of Middle Eastern oil producers and U.S. as an oil producer, and the low capacity of electricity generation globally? I mean, those are big obstacles. Huge. And, and big question. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Like we haven't figured that out yet. Right. And I and I think also, again, this idea of of options and variety, you know, to me, I look at vehicle electrification, whether it's plug in hybrid or battery electric as a drivetrain option. So I almost equate it to a vehicle segment. Right. Mm -hmm. There's minivans. Not everybody wants one. Not everybody needs one. But it, they exist. Sports right. cars, same thing, where I feel like for now or for a reasonable amount of time, that's a drivetrain option. It's going to work for some people based on this infrastructure or their needs or, or their perception of, um, you know, uh, emissions or where they want to be in terms of global warming and right, that whole right. issue. Um, so those options are there. You know, not everybody buys a Mustang. Not everybody buys a minivan. So I think for now, I look at it more like a vehicle segment than to say uh, everybody will have one of these maybe someday. Bloomberg New Energy Finance says by 2054, mm -hmm. uh, 2040, it's 54 percent are electrified Over vehicles. Over 20 years ago or 20 yeah. years from now. So. Yeah, which so. is a, which is reasonable, assuming the costs come down. And, and that's what governments are pushing for. I mean, governments are a big part of that of that equation as well. Well, you know, it's interesting. Somebody can't, he goes, this guy, um, Stuart writes in. I love that he wrote this and he had a bunch of questions and he says, um, <laughs> he says, it sounds like a lot of hoorah or hoo-ha maybe <laughs> about people switching uh, to bikes, which cost taxpayers lots of money and produce trivial results. He talks about having five kids. He said, only my youngest, there are ages 33 to 58. He says, only my youngest is anywhere what you're talking about, walking, using Uber, Lyft and public transportation. Yet he also has a car. He says we grossly uster, underestimate the time for the type of, the, you know, shift like this to take place. Mm. But it's interesting because I think until Elon Musk started really pushing things, this was even further out. And all of a sudden, everybody kind of woke up and said, oh, my God, he's doing it. Right. And especially I feel on like the, there's a Musk factor. Yeah, here. especially on the electrification side, yeah. uh, to, to Kevin's point. But but I, I do think that that the uh, the person who wrote in has a, a point that that there is a lot of hype involved here as well and that we have to sort of acknowledge and I think that that uh, you know person who wrote in sort of uh, alludes to and you know you you can see just to, to, to sort of address the the previous question too about whether we have the sort of ability to to um, you know be ready for electric cars a as much success as Elon has had with with Tesla you are starting to see a lot of complaining from some of the the true believers about man I have to wait in line for for hours to to get my car charged right. and, and there are a lot of concerns by the the companies that remain skeptics about electrification about uh, also the just how clean the uh, the the charging uh, is going to be especially for supercharging how much of that is is going to be uh, powered by coal and then are you just sort of like you know are, are how much are you uh, helping things really so. well that's I know and I well first of all there's a statistic that you mentioned you guys have to hear this one how much in terms of EVs in the United States one percent, one point three, one point four. And what about it globally? Is it is it about the same? About the same. So it's a really small. China's a big. China's two point eight or whatever it is. So they sort of tilt the balance, um, you know, above one or in that range of one percent. So it's really small market penetration. I mean, why is it? Is it electric vehicles that make sense as being the next step, or well, something else? Considering that you still need often coal, coal coal powered, you know, electrical plants. 
Well, I, I to think charge you still have uh, from the from the car maker side. I think they, to your point about what Elon has done and sort of changed the perception. I think they're really caught in this bind where they still have some real skepticism about how quickly this will will take off. Yeah. Uh, but they have to address the fact that the cool factor that Tesla has has built for itself and Elon has built for Tesla uh, is immense and has has been you know attracting a, a massive valuation. Uh, they also uh, still are sort of holding on to this idea of hybrid is going to make sense in a lot of applications. And that includes on, on self-driving vehicles mm -hmm. where uh, the systems that run these, these uh, test vehicles, uh, what they are now, that are not quite ready for prime time at, at uh, a level five capability. Right now, they're huge power sucking uh, systems uh, that do right. a, a ton of computing. And so you've heard Ford make the case that they see those uh, initially being deployed as hybrids. Uh, but to go back to, to the concern about, you know, the extent to which the regulators and, and uh, you know, the, the, whether it's the federal or state or city level, uh, whether that's going to be enough for them. If you have someone like Mary Nichols out in California who, who is a, a very admirable, uh, you know, environmental fighter, uh, she was very critical of Ford for coming out and saying that hybrid is the way forward and, and said, you know, that's not enough. Right. So there is going to be a, a lot of confusion, a lot of sort of uh, frustration, both on the regula regulatory side and, and the companies on how we sort of, you know, can come to an agreement on what's going to, to, to be workable. Because it's amazing the amount of coverage we spend on and then to hear that statistic that's yeah. only 1% of the marketplace. And I think also one thing that is not talked about enough is the profitability, right? And mm -hmm. I think there's this idea that that legacy automakers are don't have the ability to do it. They can't match Tesla in technology, um, you know, innovation, disruption, whatever it is. Um, when it's really just that inactivity, right? And if if you're General Motors and you brought Chevrolet Volt and Chevrolet Bolt to market, right? You know those costs down to the penny, right? Right, you know what you can charge. You know, you know the the business economics of that platform, of that nameplate, um, and then you don't really have to look too far at at Tesla's quarterly reports to see, you know, profits in the third quarter and fourth quarter without getting too much into, you know, the SG&A line or the R&D line that were cut severely to get them to profitability in those two quarters and say. Okay, well, that doesn't make a ton of sense as a publicly traded company to run into this space and know I'm going to lose money, right? So why don't we just walk into that a little bit more slowly when the demand and the sustainability of, of that profit structure makes sense? I love the skepticism that's coming in. A question we just got from Tonya, and she says, we live in Texas, so probably, um, but I cannot believe kids today do not even want a driver's license. Do you foresee that happening? I mean, right? I mean, you go around the country yeah. into suburbia and so on and so forth, people are still driving a lot of cars. When we were talking about, uh, before we went live, uh, about the idea of, of the fact that this is going to be a different uh, sort of evolution depending on where you are. And so I grew up in, in the country in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, there were no, Uber, there were no, and there remains no Uber and Lyft in the town that I grew up in, uh, and so there is, you know, there is going to continue to be a large swaths, especially of, of this country, where people uh, don't have any other choice uh, to to continue to own cars. Uh, but but we're talking especially about you know given the the demographics and the growth of of cities and and the amount of of people moving into cities and right. out, out from rural areas. The, the fact that this is going to be a really important uh, sort of uh, factor in, in, in where the car market goes uh, in the years to come. In our coverage in the magazine, we talked about worldwide people are migrating to mega cities. Check this out, everybody. Expected to be home to two thirds of the global population by mid century, where, as we know, an uh, automobile can be an, an expensive inconvenience. But, so. but even still, though, right? So, Kevin's not buying it. Well, but, <laughs> but, but you still have to move those people around. So whether I own yeah. the car or the Uber driver owns right. the car, somebody owns the car. And I feel like right now congestion is actually worse because you have all these people look driving around looking for rides and maybe we're just pulling people from mass transit. We're taking people from the buses or from the subways and it's actually making the situation worse. Yeah. Right. Because you have people. I don't know. My train was pretty crowded this morning. <laughs> right. right. And, and, and I took the shuttle in and it was, the, you know, we were in the bus just lane, saying. but there was plenty of traffic still coming in. Right. Well, and it's just also interesting, too, to watch the where the companies are putting their money. And so, 
you know, you, you see uh, Ford recently buying a scooter company. So right. there, there, there is definitely a sort of tacit admission on the part of the, the companies and in, in where they're investing that they, they do some see some risk here of, of the rise of, of mega cities. And you've heard uh, Bill Ford uh, talk years ago about this idea mm -hmm. that, you know, in, in India, we're not going to see two car garages like we've seen here in America or right. sometimes, you know, three, four, five car garages uh, that it's, it's not going to, to be applicable in the rest of the world. And so I think, you know, you... Micromobility. There was a great exactly. story about, was it Electra Mechanica vehicles? It's a so Canadian well. upstart, right? Yep. And, and they're talking about these, like, right, one person or two person cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these little three wheeled vehicles and... And you know those have been around uh, for some time, and we've seen them sort of come and go. We've seen, you know, just just to go back to Ford specifically, we've seen Ford's bets on these sorts of spaces come and go, where you know you, you can go back and and find uh, pictures of Bill Ford uh, wheeling out a, a bicycle at an auto show a few years ago. Uh, that sort of went away and is now sort of coming back. So I think you're going to see a lot of sort of ebbing and flow, uh, ebb and flow in the, in these spaces, but. The, the car companies are really doing a lot more experimentation that they, than they were five, 10 years ago. And lo and behold, working with one another, their rivals, they're now kind of you know, crossing back and forth. Alan writes in, he says, is the automobile industry's problem peak car or is the problem a rebellion against the automobile industry and their manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Is the problem who owns the cars and how the cars are owned or is the problem the cars? Which I think, you know, go back to the financial crisis, right? And the rescues that we had to do for General Motors and others, right? And you realize that these industries got stale, lazy, mm -hmm. and they had some problems. Yeah. Well, and, and just a, a huge build up, build up in, in liabilities. And, and yeah, I, I do think that that's that's a very valid question. I, I think you you see a, a situation, too, where, where the auto companies... Uh, sort of see a, a future where they may actually, you know, see the the rise of this these sharing models and and autonomy and electrification, but they also sort of see an opportunity here. And in, in if we're talking about uh, mega cities that do feel like there's a congestion prob problem and we're just making things worse, they see a, a situation where there could be some potential for a lot of cars to still be on the road and for them actually to, to be utilized sort of around the clock and throughout the day where mm -hmm. there's going to be, um, you know, an opportunity maybe for like a faster cycle where uh, because the, the cars are, are put to such great use, uh, they'll actually, you know, only, you know, last uh, so long. Right now we're in a situation where uh, even after, you know, car sales have, have uh, you know, sort of uh, plateaued. Uh -huh. The the vehicle population is is older and older and older. That cars are lasting longer and longer. So uh, you have to you have to fault the the companies for you know cars that pollute, cars that are unsafe and and lead to problems like congestion. But you also have to give them credit for right. the fact that they're making much better cars than they used to, including out of Detroit. Yeah, the average age is twelve years now. So you know, on the one hand, like you said, you know they get dinged for hey, build a better car, and now it lasts long enough that... Right. Cars you... don't rust out like they used to. <laughs> yes. But that does contribute to this yeah. problem of my car's lasting longer, I don't need to replace it yeah. when we right. talk about yeah. kind of peak car sales. Well, and, that, and that's the issue too, right? And it's, it's, you know, to your point, it's a horrible business, right? Capital intensive, low margin. It's about scale globally, right? It's about selling a whole bunch of units right. at a really low margin. Um, well, that's the whole thing between, you know, for Elon Musk, right, and the Model 3. The whole mm -hmm. idea was a mass market car, but right. he's struggling with that. Yeah, it's a tough business. It's, it's a terrible <laughs> business, right, and which is surprising he even got in it in the first place. Um, you know, so, so I think you, you have this situation where, um, you know, from an investor's perspective, you're looking at this business and you're going, why am I thinking about this this space where margins are terrible, you know, or, and and I think there's some pushback on that as well, not only just to the product, but as an investment. Well, let's let's do that. Bruce has a question. Um, what present U.S. auto manufacturers will remain manufacturing cars in five years' time? That's not so far away. What percentage um, of electric cars operating in the U.S. in five years will be manufactured overseas? And then we have a question about investors. Do we have any idea? Well, five years, they'll all I don't want to say all of them, but they're, most of them will still be manufacturing cars in five years. And I, and I think if you even work backwards, right, even this idea of megacities and ride-sharing, ride-hailing options, right, 
think about the population, the demographics, and, and we have to cover that mileage, right? Those vehicle miles traveled. And, and right. maybe this accessibility increases people's needs or increases the vehicle miles traveled. So those miles have to be covered by Something. some fleet, whether it's 1.3 billion or more or less. And if it's less, right, those vehicles are doing more work, right? So maybe they're replaced faster. So, you know, I, I think if you look at the, the accessibility that's needed to be covered, somebody has to own the vehicles, whether it's the manufacturer, whether it's a fleet company, whether it's the individual, we have to, we have to cover the mileage somehow. And the mileage is going up. This is a great question um, from Pat. She says, one of the most difficult things is to reorganize the city infrastructure in order to accommodate EVs and the potential smart mobility. It's easy when it comes to new cities, right? Mm -hmm. But older cities such as London, Rome, Athens, Paris, how can they rebuild their cities? So the question here is, is mobility for everyone or just for the new mega cities? Well, and, and you see really spirited debates about exactly that question with the rise of someone like Elon, right? Where he, he has made these comments about, uh, uh, about that that have been sort of perceived as, as very uh, anti uh, public transit uh, and s sort of been criticized for that um, and and sort of gotten in, gotten into his uh, sort of signature Twitter fights about that. So the boring company, I'm all in. Based on my commute <laughs> this morning, go ahead and build these tunnels that but, make it easier. But there are there are also critics of uh, who are sort of in this sort of city planning who are are raised concerns exactly like the, this person uh, raises of of. It's it's going to be very costly, right? Uh, and it, are you if you're just sort of adding additional lanes, aren't we just sort of like enabling more congestion than we would have already? And is this really the the solution? And so I think to to Kevin's earlier point, you you have what you have to do if you're a city planner, uh, a regulator, is, is you know approach this with all of the options. And I think what we're seeing is just a, a rise of more and more options where. Who would have thought, you know, 10 years ago that you would see scooters all over the place yeah, in Detroit, right? right? But they're there. <laughs> but they're there in the or Motor City. Or even the bikes, right, yeah. that yep. have, have come into major cities. Yeah, and, and to this point, you know, I, I, I think about this, and, and to Craig's point, you know, like, we have scooters. Yeah, I remember the first time in Detroit tripping over one, like, somebody left their scooter <laughs> over the sidewalk. You well, know, and there's complaints about that. So, yeah. people, yes. so cities are kind of figuring this out. But, but I think... You know, the idea of level five and that being really the, the, the tipping point, right? If it were possible, that level five, and you think about what's needed to make that possible, which would be this whole vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure connectivity that's, that's consistent all the time. And I think, you know, I drive, and I only drive eight miles to work, and, I, and I'm like, we can't fix the potholes. <laughs> right. On so my eight gonna mile get... drive, yet we're going to rewire the entire city for you know, for this self-driving, because the only way to me it works is if the vehicles are talking to each other and they're talking right. to the infrastructure. And I'm saying, where does that funding but come? How does that happen? You've got to say, like the cars, I think even my car, like on a highway, yeah. it works. Oh, yeah. They're talking to each other already. And yeah. you can see how that could work. I don't, you know, downtown and, and so on and so forth. I think that's going to be more difficult. It's really tricky and it's hilarious. There have been some great stories uh, done the last few years about uh, sort of the the peak place where you can go to for all the hype about all this stuff is is Las Vegas and CES. Yeah. And it's hilarious. It's deeply ironic that that there's all this hype about this stuff. And if you want to get around Las Vegas for that show, good luck. It's a it, nightmare. Huge taxi lines, tons of traffic, tons of congestion. It's it's terrible. And, <laughs> and the funny thing was not this CES in in January, but the year before it rained, and it mm. hadn't rained in you know 280 days or something. And, and so that you know, there's the 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 rubber in the street basically that lets it expand because it gets so hot. Well, that gets slippery as soon, and then it was just what a it was mayhem. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it was mayhem. So, I have a couple more things I just want to get to, and then we have to wrap up. Um, Kevin writes in, and it's a question I think for you because it's an investor question, which I think is so relevant to, to all of us at, <laughs> at Bloomberg. He says, because first of all, you've got GM plowing a billion into self-driving cars. They're planning to debut a robo taxi service later this year. They've got 500 million in Lyft. Daimler and BMW pouring more than a billion into a jointly owned car sharing. There is billions. Of dollars going into all of electric vehicles and self-driving. So Kevin writes in, as an investor who holds stock in several automobile manufacturers,
manufacturers, I'm concerned about eroding profit margins across the board. So many companies are making great cars that it's difficult for any one company or brand to set itself apart enough to keep up those margins. Add in massive investment requirements for new technologies, and I've begun to wonder if holding my underperforming automobile stocks makes sense. And they are underperforming the S&P this year as well as over the past Personal. year. Kevin, that's right yeah, here. Yeah, so um, the autonomous features, even if it never gets to the level five, I think are helpful. To your point, driving, you know, New York to Florida in the middle lane on, you know, I-95, you don't need to be engaged all the time. Same thing sitting in city traffic. You probably don't need to be engaged all the time. And I think what the smarter companies, and I think um, you know Toyota was one, and and Ford's Argo AI is is working on, is that handoff between the two? Because I think mm -hmm. that's the big problem now. Right. Is that you engage a, a sort of autonomous system, and the machine has a hundred percent of the. Right, you're supposed to be watching and paying attention, hands on the wheel, but you really don't have control during that period. The machine has 100% of the control right. until something goes wrong and it doesn't know what to do, and then it punts 100% of the control back to you whether or not you're ready or not. And I think what you're going to see a lot of that investment going towards is that transition. So rather than replace one or the other, let's make that uh, sort of complement the ability of the driver, which should never really be at 0%. Right. Mm. Right? And so... And that's my point is I'm not sure we ever get to the point where the machine does 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. So what does this mean for auto manufacturers? And if I'm an investor and holding those stocks, what do I do? Right. Well, I think I think right now the valuation, the hype is towards this. We're going to do level five and then we're going to change the world with this level five because you don't need to own your car. But then you know, and I think that's wrong. I think a lot of this investment is going towards making vehicles safer, um, more useful, and I, I don't think, I think we go to that end game, right? We go to full self-driving, we go to elect electrification for mm -hmm. everyone. Nobody ever dies on the highway anymore. And I don't think that's really the goal of this investment, right? You, automakers are some of the most, in, and always have been, some of the most innovative companies yeah, out yeah. there. But they get, you know, this, this, there's this concept that they just bend metal in the shape of cars. Um, so, so there is value to that investment. There will be return on that investment. Um, there did come in a question uh, from Daniel. I'd like to know your thoughts of developing countries and how car ownership will be affected there. And we think about China. Their auto market has been growing for year after year. They, sales did fall, I think, in 2018. We saw some, mm -hmm. some slowdown, and I think it was their first drop since the early 19, eight, um, 1990s. So emerging markets or China not the great savior when it comes to the auto industry? Well, I think that's one of the things that would, when we would hear pushback in, in January in Detroit, it was, a, it was about these places like China uh, where there's sort of this expectation that this is just a blip that we're seeing and that we'll see a return to growth. And I, I think what you have to sort of uh, question is, is whether there are going to be uh, places in the world where cars will not catch on like they've they've caught on in this country or or did in, right. in you know sort of the post-war boom. I mean, look at the financial sector, right? You think about China is they're doing everything on their phone. Emerging markets are doing everything on their phone. It's not credit cards and other things right. like we see in the United States. And there there are a ton of people. There's a, a lot of growth and wealth, and so you know generally uh, in in the past decades, you would it was a safe bet to see those things coming and to see sort of car ownership and vehicle sales follow. And I think what, what this story did such a great job of sort of capturing is that uh, those assumptions may not be safe anymore, that you'll, you may see cases where uh, developing uh, countries uh, don't turn to the car like we saw uh, places like the U.S. and, and uh, Western Europe uh, turn to the car in, in sort of the, the right. boom of past decades. Right, and I think it would be equivalent to putting, you know, a landline on the wall. Right. Right, <laughs> and then going to Does anybody sell. even, right. there's a whole generation right. that doesn't right. even know what a landline right. is. You, you, you would there. just jump over that technology altogether and get to the... Yeah. We do have to wrap up, but I just want to get some final thoughts for you guys, because the question is kind of, you know, car ownership, it's been a great thing, uh, had a great run. Is that it? I mean, are we going to look back in 10 years from now and say, OK, this was peak car? Yeah, I, I think there there are still, you know, to, to the company's uh to the company's credit, uh, they they do have this uh, these reasons to think that 
you know, even if we don't get to near the ownership race that we've we've seen in sort of the Western world, if you will, there is still a potential for us to to, to co- continue to grow. But I do think that with with the rise of, of technology, with the rise of these other options that that could uh, enable people to get around uh, just just more efficiently and more safely, uh, there there is sort of a, a real open question about whether we'll get to. Uh, the levels that we saw just in, in the last couple of years ever again. Right. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, and it might be semantics, so maybe we were or are at peak car, but it will still be a lot of car, mm. right? So, and China's a good example. It's not a case of, this is this great picture, I don't know if everybody can see this, but the cover <laughs> of cars piling up. Right. You're not expecting that anytime soon? No. And there'll be a lot of good cars for me to buy then. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, and China's the example, right, <clears throat> where it has a... a the first year where it hadn't grown since the 90s or whatever yeah. it is, it's still 20-plus million vehicles mm-hmm. a year. So right, right. even if that plateaus or declines a little bit, it's still a lot of units moving, and I think that's the situation globally. Are we 100 million globally? Are we 85 million globally, right? And if we're in that range somewhere, there's going to be uh, continuous investment in the space. There's going to be new options, um, but there's going to be profits to be made even at that lo- level, even if we don't go f- to 85 to 100 to 150 to, you know, even if the peak is passed, it's still going to be a lot, of, a lot of vehicles. It's still a pretty healthy industry. Yeah. And there's still going to be a lot of manufacturing. Um, Kevin and Craig, thank you so much. Really great stuff. And we do want to thank everybody. I know I didn't get to all of your questions. <laughs> we could have kept talking. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And do be sure to check out uh, Bloomberg.com for Kevin's research, for Craig's writing. Lots of great stories on the auto industry. Do be sure to check out, too, Bloomberg Business Week on the radio and on the weekends on radio and TV with myself and my co-host, Jason Kelly. And have a great day, everybody. And be sure to join us for another edition of Bloomberg Business Week Talks.